think I actually kicked recording. So you just see that red button. And ready? You're listening to WMPG 90.9 Gorham, Portland, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way Galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me as always is Bernie Rhyme, TJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Bernie, doing? Thank you. Um, hold on, pause. Bernie, uh... Joining me, as always, is Bernie Rhyme, DJ Star Watcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie's our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our local protector of the night sky. Reach out to us at WMPG, scientifically speaking, at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And if you go to WMPG.org, you can find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie. Could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Yes, certainly I'll do that. So today will be Friday, June 4th. So we're going to have a waning crescent moon. Basically, it won't rise till about 2.30 in the morning. The new moon will be on June 10th. So basically, that would leave um, us able to see Mars as an evening planet. Venus has joined Mars about a month ago, so you can see two planets at the night. And then if you like to get up early, you can see Jupiter and Saturn. And you should keep your eye on Mars, because I'm sure you know about the Perseverance rover. And by now, the helicopter should be working. They were just starting to test it um, last back in April. So it's called the Ingenuity, and it's like flying a helicopter at, ten, at 100,000 feet above the surface. The air is so thin on Mars that it's going to be really challenged, and I'm sure everything will work fine on it. So you probably have heard about some of the great images that a drone took on another planet. So look for that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Bernie. Yeah, you're welcome. And if you couldn't take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. Today's show is, and because I'm so amazing at creating titles for our shows after three years, um, is all about the women who map the stars. And we have a very special guest on our show today who, um, is actually the director of this play. And so we have Professor Sarah Valentine, who is Professor of Theater at USM since 2016 and has worked with several theaters, including the Milwaukee Repertory Theater, the Arden Theater of Philadelphia, and various Shakespeare festivals around the country. And in 2019, Professor Valentine brought the play called The Women Who Map the Stars by Boston-based playwright Joyce Van Dyke to USM's Russell Hall. Professor Valentine, welcome to the show. Thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, just so our listeners can get a, more of a sense of your background uh, beyond my brief intro, what brought you into the world of theater and what do you think is the goal of theater? That's a really good question on both, both, both points. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I was a high school theater person who just loved hanging out in the theater and making things and storytelling and, uh, decided that I would, I would go to college and pursue it and, um, took, you know, classes in dramatic literature and performance and got uh, a bachelor's degree in theater arts and just started going out into the world, doing all kinds of different theater things. I worked in a box office. I worked in a costume shop. I did a lot of teaching um, through education departments with theater, theater programs and um, regional theaters and uh, did a lot of improv and just sort of made my way uh, into the theater world. And I can I think of myself as a storyteller through the medium of theater. And I think uh, what theater does is an opportunity at it plays with reality because there's anything really is possible in theater. Um, it's about community. It brings people together to hear and share stories and share experiences. And ideally the best theater is um, transformative and it can uh, change a point of view. It can enlighten, it can, it can be downright just fun and entertaining, but uh, people who come and see theater and experience theater and we get to share the space with, with people um, our goal is to have them leave the, that experience learning something or feeling moved or, uh, you know, feel a sense of agency to learn more or do more or just um, uh, support theater arts as a fun way to hear stories. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I, I'm always astounded by how well on stage they're able to portray kind of different time spans mm -hmm. and like, you know, I don't know, like our, our show here, it's always, it's just this 30 minutes. And I feel like in, in film, it's a little easier to show, you know, with their transitions that you've jumped forward many, many years, but in, in theater on the, on the stage, that's a little bit more subtle, but it's like, oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs> and I, I always thought that was very cool. The transitions are very, very well done. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, playwrights help a lot in that, you know, the, the, a great playwright knows how to con condense time and uh, through dialogue or great designers through a certain type of transition. Um, time, time in theater is not, not real. Nothing really is, nothing is really real in theater. <laughs> A mentor, uh, Adrian Hall, who was a who was sort of like the the father of regional theater in America. He used to say, or he probably still says, um, that the only reality in theater is that people are people are coming, that an audience is coming, and they bought a ticket. That's really the, everything else. Everything else is up for grabs. I love that. I feel like that could be in itself some kind of you know how we have Interstellar and all those other time travel, not time travel, but you know. <laughs> going moving uh, at the speed of light like i feel like that could be a astronomy type um topic yeah and i think that's that's another function of theater too is to sort of just um i i don't like to say like escape the current reality but sort of allow your imagination to be in another time another place another with different people uh and knowing that it's just a finite experience and then the lights come back up and here we are and hopefully we've had a moment of transformation mm -hmm. Yeah. That's um, it's actually very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today's show, we wanted to focus on this one particular play called um, Women Who Map the Stars. And I mentioned it briefly, but this essentially follows a few of the historical figures known as the Harvard computers. Um, primarily, it's the five, uh, five of the women, Wilhelmina Fleming, Annie Jump Cannon, Antonia Mori, Henrietta Swan Lovett and Cecilia Payne. And um, I know uh, uh, this play isn't on stage right now, but for our listeners who have never seen the play, how would you describe what the play is about? So the play, it takes these five women and these were five real live human beings who were alive on the pian planet. And um, they worked at different times and some of them together, their time at the Harvard Conservatory overlapped at the turn of the century. And the play, uh, talking about bending time and playing with time, the genre of play is called magical realism, which is which really allows it. It even takes the idea that theater can do anything another step, so that there's a there's a bit of magic in the play. In that the character of Cecilia Payne, who was born in 1900, comes to the Harvard Observatory to do her graduate what what would have been considered her graduate training in 1923, mm -hmm. when some of these women had already died or weren't. Yeah. The observatory but in the in the play these women interact and using real life uh testimony and documents and journals the playwright has woven together um how it could have how these women might have had conversations mm -hmm. and part of the idea of the story is that the the achievements we have are are built on the shoulders we're standing on the shoulders of those who have who have advanced our field or or our um you know, our, our education about a certain something. And that one of the themes of the stories is how these women, whether or not in real life they ever met, they really truly did inspire each other and made it possible for the next, the next great advancement in astrophysics to happen. Um, then there's all kinds of, there's some political commentary in the play about uh, the women not receiving recognition in their time for the work that they mm -hmm. did. Um, the women at the Harvard Conservatory, just who were considered the Harvard computers, they didn't get the same pay that the ma their male counterparts did. They weren't allowed to use specific the certain equipment that the ma their male counterparts were able to use, and yet they still made incredible contributions and advancement mm -hmm. that allowed their male counterparts to also have advancements in their fields of study. So. Yeah, 
Yeah, I know. And I, I'm sure, Bernie, you can also speak to this because you teach it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the work that they that these women did were really fundamental to what we know and how we understand astronomy today. Um, for example, Henrietta and Annie and Antonia had s helped with the s classification of stars. And um, I think Henrietta was, was she the one who did the distance to stars? Yep. Period she luminosity thought. relationship of yep. Cepheid variables. She yeah. should have won a Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then um, Cecilia Payne, she was the one who had um, her, she originally, it was a theory, but she had written her thesis on how the most abundant element in the universe was hydrogen um, and got a lot of flack for that. Um, <laughs> but I think um, out of all five, though, you know, you were talking about. Um, kind of this perspective of not really getting the credit that they deserve. Um, I don't, I didn't know all of them, you know, I don't know them personally or anything, but Cecilia and Antonia, I think they were kind of identified as being the most outspoken about it. Um, Antonia had, uh, like she had quit because basically the guy who the director didn't, didn't even just had her in a footnote. Oh, she did. She did a little bit of help here. <laughs> and then Cecilia, I think she, yeah, she was very also outspoken. She wrote several books about her experience and her, her life as well. Um, and so Professor Valentine, did you know about the story of the Harvard computers before the play was, before you saw the play? I did not. And I, I feel like in my memory, I had heard on NPR, um, the uh, there was a book that had come out that Dava Sobel authored. I think it's called the the Glass Universe. I yeah, yeah, I have that book. It's a great book. Yeah, and and I know that Joyce Van Dyke read it and and spent time with that book in researching these different characters. And I remember in the back of my mind thinking that's interesting. You know, like how you have the radio on and you're listening, and like a story comes on, and oh, here's a segment about the Harvard Conservatory and Davos Sobel's new book. And, and I sort of was like, oh, that's interesting. I'll I'll t p tuck that away as like something I'd like to look at. And then about a month later, uh, you know, I subscribe to all kinds of um, theater announcements and um, I subscribed to something like What's Happening Boston and popping up in that thread was this play. And I thought, that's weird. I just heard this <laughs> segment on NPR. Um, and, there, yeah, and so it was sort of like a serendipitous kind of like, that's interesting. That's curious. And that's when I, I, um, I didn't know, I think I could have told you Annie Jump Cannon had something to do with astrophysics, but honestly, the other names, I, I hadn't recognized any of these, any of these women had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like that was around the time when, you know, Hidden Figures, was, well, Hidden yeah. Figures came out in 2016. I don't know when it came out, uh, but it was like that whole, like, time period where it was all like oh there were these things called human computers and their stories are being told like all at once <laughs> yeah it's funny how those those trend I, I hate to call the trend but how that the, the, the sort of um you know the yeah our, brain, our braves are, our brains are on the same frequency where all these sudden these stories the similar stories begin to crop up at the same right. time right and so you went to see it i assume yes yes and and you did you meet the playwright? So uh, I bought some tickets and I think I purposely bought tickets on a night when they were doing a talk back. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, if I'm going to go down to Boston, it was being done in Cambridge at a little theater called Central Square Theater, who has a grant with MIT to produce a, a series in their season every year around women in science. Mm -hmm. Um, and like the year after they did Map the Stars, they did another play called Photograph 51, which was about oh, nice. um, the yep. DNA, the photograph that identified what DNA basically was and how that scientist wasn't, <laughs> that woman wasn't <laughs> recognized for that contribution um, until posthumously. So I, we went down, had a, you know, had a nice morning in Cambridge waiting to go see the, I think it was a matinee possibly. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, there was a talk back and the talk back had the playwright Joyce Van Dyke there. So. Um, if you can imagine, I had the playbill and I turned to my husband, I said, do you have a pen? And I just started you know, making all kinds of scribbles. 
Um, the play was very moving. It was well done. There were these strong women characters, like all the reasons why, you know, it would work at a university, you know, it's mm -hmm. educational, um, it's timely. And as I started making notes, I realized like this was the fall of 2018 that I saw the play that if I could contact the playwright and find out if she was interested in having another production of it done, because this was its professional premiere at Central Square Theater, that if we worked it into the 2019-20 season, it also coincided with the 100th anniversary of the suffragette, um, the, oh, you know, the 19th yeah. Amendment. And that's where also then the idea was like, what if we did a, a whole season of plays that were about highlighting and, and empowering women's voices? So going and seeing this one play, just to kind of see what it was about, sort of also just knocked a bunch of other dominoes that became uh, for USM theater, a season of plays written by women, directed by women and highlighting, highlighting women's voices as, as the theme. Yeah. So I guess on that same note, I think what stood out to me, um, like for example, some of the books like Deva, Deva's book on the glass universe, um, the hidden figures book, they still kind of included the male colleagues and kind of still included their stories um, and those authorities. But this play was an all-female cast, and then it was completely telling the story from their perspective. Um, like, there wasn't a single, I don't think that there was a single male actor in it. Correct. Yeah, it really was a showcase for these five different historical women. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe uh, highlight who the cast was for, for this play? Sure. Yeah, um, uh, two Two of the young women have graduated. Meg Mayfield played Annie Jump Cannon and Jackie Condon played Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina Fleming, who historically was like the, chronologically was the first woman at the conservatory to be highlighted. She she discovered the Horsehead Nebula. Mm -hmm. And then um, Halsey Redman and Cami Gibson are two of our current seniors. They're gonna be graduating in May. Halsey played Henrietta Swan Levitt and Cami played Cecilia Payne. And our other student, Alyssa Pearl Ross, uh, who's going to be, a, she's a rising senior. Um, she played Antonia Murray. Yeah. Um, side note, I loved how, I didn't know that uh, Wilhelmina was kind of nicknamed Mina. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really cute throughout the play. I was like, oh, that's a cute like nickname mm -hmm. for her. Um, what were the students like and what were their initial reactions to the screenplay? They, uh, they fell in love with it and they fell in love with it for a couple reasons. They fell in love with it because of the, the really, the, the storytelling of the play itself and how the characters were woven together. They were, had they didn't know these stories ex existed. And I think that was another thing that appealed to them was they got to spend time, um, you know, learning who these women were and recognizing their contributions which which again you know it, it, it's a lovely way to honor these characters mm -hmm. to know that now the the group that worked on the play um wilhelmina fleming is buried in mount auburn cemetery in in the boston area and i think i think three out of the five actors have gone down since since the play i i got a text over the summer that says sarah i was down in mount auburn and they t you know took a picture of wilhelmina's grave and so you know it's not like they did the play and forgot about it mm -hmm. they really these the women they portrayed really left a mark on them and also from a historical perspective the 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 social political injustices and ramifications like wow this idea of women not being paid equitably equitably to men still is around or you know like people not just women but underrepresented voices that don't get acknowledgement for the contributions they make in their fields of expertise is still a thing um and i think it really it really hit home for them that telling this story was a way to also remind everyone like and there's still work to be done mm -hmm. and then there's just the magic of a of a small cast of all women you know, being led by a, a, a female director as well, um, they bonded, they really, mm -hmm. really bonded as a group. And some of them didn't know each other, but sharing their stories as the characters, but then also having this relationship as fellow students working on this project, they still say, you know, we're, we're, we're still the best friends. Like we found oh. our, we found each other as friends through this process. So that was also really a beautiful thing to see them as students um, sharing ownership of this project together and, and, ha and, you know, taking a trip down to Mount Auburn Cemetery. <laughs> um, they had a good 
chat going and <laughs> no that's awesome it's such a kind of wonderful celebration of of everything really um yeah. I, i'd like to think that the women of the harvard uh, observatory you know were winking down on us from out in you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, look at how these women came together mm -hmm. to tell this story the same way we came together at different times and shared mm -hmm. our stories. And yeah, I mean, if you uh, see any of the historical photos of their, I guess, lab area, I mean, they're in a very small space, <laughs> mm -hmm. sharing a lot of, uh, yeah, sharing a lot of things with each other, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were some of the most challenging aspects of directing the play or maybe for the students actually acting it out? Uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, in terms of acting, the character of Wilhelmina Fleming is Scottish. So uh, Jackie, <laughs> Jackie, I know she's like, I don't know if I'm getting the Scottish dialect. So we did. And Cecilia Payne was also from the UK. So yeah. there were two character, two of these actors had to had to learn dialects, which can be challenging yeah. on top of everything else. Um, but um, I wouldn't say there were as many challenges as there were just a lot of conversations on how to how to honor and celebrate these women, how to make them, how to, I don't like using the word real, but bringing an authenticity to them to not, mm -hmm. to make them feel three dimensional yeah. um, versus just, you know, actors and characters in a play, but to, and that involved some, you know, some backstory research and um, asking questions like, why didn't they stand up and say something? What mm -hmm. were the repercussions of saying something? You know, what was that environment at the conservatory like? What, what, what would it have been like to be the only woman presenting at a conference full of, full of men who didn't, who didn't really think that what you had to say was valuable? Um, mm -hmm. and, just, and just trying to put, put ourselves in the position um, to look through their lenses and, mm -hmm. and while also looking through this 21st century lens of uh, where are there still injustices? Where are there still um, places that we can bring attention to, um, you know, the people, the women who have inspired us, all the women who have inspired us. Right, right. That's, um, I guess it's a very multifaceted kind of way to consider how you tell this story. It, it is um, kind of reminiscent of, I had a, uh, I had one professor who, when he taught about like historical figures, he would always um, talk about their quirks and basically giving them a personality, right? Not not just this is what they did and this is what they, um, you know, contributed to the world. And I actually, I think you guys did a really nice job with that. And obviously some of that is due to the, the playwright herself, but um, yeah, it did it did make you feel like, oh, wow, like we could have been friends or I can see their friendship, yeah. Um, is there an astronomer out of the five that you felt particularly maybe close with or you thought she was particularly um, that she stood out, I guess? I, I'm really intrigued, but I think they're all amazing. And I, 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 I really am intrigued by Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina Fleming's story that she, she came to the United States with her husband who then abandoned her and then she you know started out as a housekeeper in in the household of the director of the conservatory and just worked her way up to then being the mm -hmm. head of the the women computers and ma she was a self-taught astrophysicist and that sort of blows my mind mm -hmm. um that that it's almost again like uh, serendipitous that she happened to get a job in the house of the director of the, and that she was so, she was so good at housekeeping and being detailed oriented that then Pickering gave her a chance to do that at the conservatory. So it's sort of just, you know, that, that either fate or destiny, she was, this was her calling and she was destined to do it. And, and it happened for her. And also how um, she really was, was a very motherly figure to these women and a, um, a sister motherly figure that they, they all looked up to. And I, I just, um, you know, as someone who's in, you know, I'm chair of the theater department and I, I like to hope that I can, I just resonated with, with Mina's, you know, you, you want to be caring and loving, but you also have to get stuff done. Um, you know, there are deadlines to meet. And I, I, I just really um, thought that she was such a balanced 
um, com- she seems like such a compassionate figure and also curious, intellectually curious. Yeah. Um, so I really, there's something about Mina. I really, I really, uh, like Jem John. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we actually have a clip from the play and, um, didn't want to do too many spoilers, but I think everybody knows that, you know, Cecilia did discover hydrogen um, as being the most abundant uh, element in the universe. And so this is a clip on on her relaying that to Mina, who obviously wasn't around at the time, but it kind of showcases her, that interaction in the play. Have you found something? You've never felt more alone in the universe. What have you found? Evidence! Evidence of what? I've been working out the various elements instead of active. Eighteen elements. My breakthrough was with silicon. I love silicon. It's always been one of my favorite elements. I've been working through them all one by one. Silicon, carbon, magnesium, and iron. And I keep getting results. It makes no sense. What is it? It makes no sense, but I keep getting it. Are you going to tell me? Iron is not the most abundant element. Not in the stellar atmospheres. What is? What is? Hydrogen. Hydrogen? By far. In second state helium. But hydrogen by far. By far? How far? It makes me never say it. A million times. And then, so Professor Valentine, um, now you are actually working with the playwright on um, bringing this work to Maine Middle and High Schools. What will that look like? How did that, like, how did that happen? It was really, you know, people mention something and it's sort of like a seed gets planted. And one of my colleagues, after seeing the show, said, uh, you know, I, I, it would be my wish that every every fourth grader could see this play. Um, and that just sort of was like, well, what would that look like? What would it look like to take a piece of theater out into the main community with the idea of getting it in front of younger audiences so that they too can hear these stories and be inspired. I always ask the the students when we work on a play, like, what do we want the audiences left with? Why are we doing this play now? What's the message we want? And a, and a big part of the message we were hoping would happen with this play was that it would inspire people to either learn more about these women, but also to, to pursue their dreams. Like this, that, that there's gonna be obstacles. It's not always easy. Um, you, you have to find your, your the champions who will keep you afloat when things are really stormy. And what a great message that we could bring to, you know, high school students and middle school students at a time when they're learning more, that the, their education in terms of like math and science is deepening, mm-hmm. but maybe they don't know if they want to do it or how they can, how they can make a life of that. You know, how do you, and even theater, like bringing theater out to the schools for students who are inspired by the arts to go, wow, you can study theater in college. And wow, people go out and actually make a career as, as artists. So part of it is like to, to spread the story. And also it's, it's a way that we hope will just inspire younger audiences to follow as corny or cheesy as that sounds, like follow your dream, fo- listen to your passion. What is it that's calling you and, and how can you find a way to now bring that out into the world and, and really follow your passion and, and fi- find your dream? So I, I brought this idea to Joyce Van Dyke, the playwright, and she was all for it because she, <laughs> you know, we, she wants the stories to be told as well. So we had to first think about time frame and, and you know, what a, what a school could say yes to. Um, and the original script is about 85 minutes. So we knew we had to kind of bring it down to under an hour so that schools could say, yeah, come on in and we'll bring everybody into the auditorium for an hour and watch the play. So the play, um, the essence of it is still there. Some of the sci- the more sciencey things have sort of been reworked yeah. so that it really is more of a showcase of these women and a thumbnail of their discoveries. And Cecilia, yeah. Cecilia's thread is very strong. But we do lose a lot of um, some of the sciency conversation. Mm. But we thought of things to of things to focus on, um, letting people know that these women existed, that the Harvard Conservatory was a thing, that um, uh, was sort of the the direction we went in for this new school play adaptation, school version adapta- adaptation. 
yeah, you always got to make some compromises here and there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Professor Valentine, for joining us on Scientifically Speaking and for sharing about um, your experience with bringing the women who map the stars to USM. I'm assuming that you guys don't have anything live right now at Russell Hall going on. I wish I could say we did. No, the students this semester have been doing uh, week-long workshops, mm -hmm. and some of the product of their workshops can be found on the USM Theater website. So if people, and we did do a radio play um, in the fall that is also on the website. So, but but do get ready for next fall because we will be back. We hope in <laughs> with with live 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 in person things. Yeah, no. Hopefully, um, we'll be all ready to go in fall of 2021. Thank you so much, Professor Valentine. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie, and Professor Sarah Valentine. Stay tuned for Sports Jam with Colin and Connor. And from your favorite nerds, mask up, and we wish you healthy bodies and clean air.